Okay. Oh. And here we go. My name is Chris Davis. This is Journeys in Podcasting. We have a Saturday morning edition. And today we have, we're lucky enough to talk to Josh Berker. He's in New York and he has innovated uh, a lot of maker ed projects, but also a lot of specifically turtle art. So today we'll be talking about the original Seymour Papert's turtle art and some of the projects that Josh is doing with it. So Josh, who are you? What's your, what's your position? What, what, what do you do? Yeah, thanks, Chris, for having me. Um, I met Chris at Constructing Modern Knowledge uh, a few years ago. Uh, this is my first year at Marymount School in Manhattan, uh, where I teach sixth, seventh, and eighth grade uh, girls. Um, and I, I've taken over the, the fabrication lab that James Deck started there. Um, so we have a variety of, of really cool tools and supplies uh, that we we explore um, together. The classes that I teach there are all um, creative technology is, is the name of the class. So I have a pretty uh, pretty wide range and 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 um, ability to to make of that what I will. Um, so this year, you know, my, my first year we've been exploring um, circuitry, we've been exploring microcontrollers and robots and programming and um, various fabrication techniques, automatons. Um, so we've been having, you know, all sorts of fun and, on all sorts of levels, but uh, kind of the common thread through the, the three grades is turtle art and, um, and exposing them to that idea. So currently um, in class six, we're working using the, the web based version of, of turtle art um, to create designs in the spirit of medieval um, tiles. And, and that's a collaborative project with, with class six art um, for the big medieval festival that the girls will be having. Um, class seven spent first semester uh, really um, um, immersed in a deep dive of, of logo programming through uh, Art Logo, uh, which is um, a browser-based version of Logo, also programmed by, by Brian Silverman. Um, but it's text-based, and we use that in conjunction with uh, the Logo Turtle, which is a, a Arduino-based um, uh, floor robot um, that, that Brian and Eric Nauman and I invented back in, in 2015, sort of remixing somebody else's project uh, and the, the 3D printed parts from that and, and changing the microcontroller and, and changing the, the actual operating system it was using to logo. Um, and then class eight just finished up a project that, <clears throat> pardon me, Aaron Riley uh, helped me with, um, with uh, edgelet acrylic that uh, I led the, the eighth grade girls through um, a series of exercises in, in Art Logo where we programmed um, organic forms. So we started with grasses and then moved to, um, to stems and leaves and then flowers and, and then trees. And then what could you, you build with those tools that we could use a laser to etch and three millimeter acrylic and then build a little wooden box that contained a circuit that the girls constructed with three LEDs and, and a switch um, to turn it on. So logo really permeates and, and weaves in and out throughout my, my curriculum. Um, I think because as, as Seymour Papert put it like logo, is was built to teach you to think about thinking. And so I, I hope in the, the projects that I'm, I'm doing with, with turtle art and other variations of logo, beyond the, the cool designs you're creating, you're really learning how to break down a, a problem into manageable steps and build tools that allow you to, to solve the problem as it were. Let's back up just a little bit because yeah. you, you've covered a book's worth. I covered of, a lot of ground. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just outlined the table of contents of your of your next book. Um, yeah. Let's go back to Artemis Papert. I think that's the daughter of Seymour Papert and Brian yes. Silverman, your colleagues that you work with. 
And I, I didn't know that you were at Marymount because uh, last time I talked to you, you were at a different school and James yeah. Deck has moved to a different school. So I see there's been a New York shuffling around. But it's yeah, really it's pretty that- like, um, you know, it's just like kind of family. And yeah, when somebody moves, somebody else has to like, you know, move their seat. And <laughs> shuffle yeah, all and I've been to that lab uh, of James, uh-huh. that James Deck set up there in the middle yeah. school and very cool what he had stocked it with. But it sounds like you have. Uh, taken it to a new level I didn't know well like we we have different you know we have different skill sets and and so like this year it's really been a a process of like well what is here you know and what what can we use and and what scales well you know like I the for just as a quick like tangent you know like that that's a big part of like managing a lab like that is is what tool can you you scale with so the vinyl cutter, for example, used to be a very popular tool for building stickers and whatnot. And, and I could see the real value in that, but I have a hard time kind of figuring out how do you keep 19 girls occupied when you're cutting the, the 20th girl's um, design, you know, and I haven't yet quite gotten my head around, you know, obviously I need to sort of stack all the designs in one cut and whatnot, but um but yeah, you know, it, it, it's been it's been cool inheriting his lab and kind of uh, seeing how he built it and, and thinking about where where it'll be in 10 years, you know, down the road. I think you touched on something else that may be important to mention, too, and that when schools are setting up these labs, um, it's very important to think through and hire through uh, the individual skill set that you know, everybody comes with such a different box of maker tools and programming tools that the, the closest I've seen to this is some of the MYP and uh, DP design classes, mm-hmm. which are often very open and very dependent on what the individual brings. So if yes. someone's very strong in wood cutting, then the kids might do a lot of wood cutting and having that kind of flexibility. And as you said, it's about getting at thinking through complex problems you know, the Minsky Papert model of breaking one problem down into a bunch of individual problems. Um, but that's what you're really getting at. And I mm-hmm. find the discussion often devolves into kind of engineering standards or whatever the school is pushing for curriculum. But I think in the lab setup, it should be very much kind of flower out from what does this person bring and what can they set up across classes and grade levels. Um, let's back up even more and talk about low floors, wide walls, and high ceilings, and why Mm -hmm. turtle art might be a great entry point for a lot of students into coding and making and thinking through complex problems. Yeah, so I think the the greatest value of turtle art is that it's an honest um, micro world, and that you aren't going to use turtle art to program a game, for example. Like turtle art does one thing really well. It, it helps you to produce art. Um, and it's, it's, you know, Brian Silverman jokes that once they got the interface to fit on a, a postcard, they knew that they, they had, you know, the UI figured out. Um, you know, it, it's just a, an incredibly simple tool that um, 12 years later, I'm still doing new things with. You know that 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 it's not limited um, in in its scope, but it's not intimidating in in its initial usage. You know, one of the the hurdles with Scratch, which admittedly has done an amazing job of scaffolding it. You know, for the beginner, and when you first start, like it launches you into a tutorial. <clears throat> Scratch is still can still be intimidating because of the number of blocks and and you know the 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 blocks and turtle art are all focused at helping you to create art and that that's that um, so so that's what the low floor is all about um, but as I say you know twelve years later I'm I'm still able to do new things with the tool um, Brian asked me a while back. You know, how long did it take you to get good at turtle art, as it were? And thinking about it, I told him it took about four years, you know, of, of working with it before, you know, I was creating something that I felt was uniquely mine and I was able to capture what it was that I saw in my head and, and, um, 
and produce that. And I think too, like part of it because of the position I am in too, like part of that experience um, and skill and ability was being able to show other people how to do it. You know, being able to teach people how to use turtle art. Um, so, so that's the crux of, of why I returned to turtle art again and again. Um, and then I've, I've incorporated art logo into my tool set just because I think learning to express yourself in a text-based programming, you know, end of, of logo, I think it, it sort of encourages a bit more craftiness as it were. And, and attack, you know, I see when some of my students who, who into the, the art logo experience like are still writing super long procedures that, that span the, the length of the screen. Whereas the aim is to do it, you know, do it elegantly in, in maybe 15 lines of code. And so that kind of takes, takes the programming to the next level in terms of, well, how do you, you know, how do you think of, of what you're doing as um, expressing something that expresses over time? And, and how can you be elegant about that? Um, and, and so that, that sort of is the, the reward of getting to that next level of uh, programming and then even you know like um we'll discuss later you know when we talk more about microcontrollers but the the limitations imposed therein um and and uh you know working with a microcontroller um there's a difference in the type of art you can produce with a floor turtle versus what you can produce on the screen and and that's an interesting challenge i have two next questions, but let's take one at a time. This go first into the kind of the people that are creating turtle art and the modern tools that we're creating it on. So like, for example, IMAX are a pretty big interface that kids can have access to if they have that in their computer lab. Is there any notion that turtle art would expand into taking advantage of bigger screen interfaces of finding ways to take advantage of like basically just the physical things that we're looking at it on. Yeah, I think like if you run it, it so I think you mentioned that, that you'd installed Turtle Art. So you all might be still running the, the Java, you know, desktop version, but definitely run it in the web browser now. Um, so I have one from the web browser. Uh, I have to actually look at my notes to see which link we're using, but there's there's one that creates a nice, it's the same exact same blocks mm -hmm. um, and so that's what we're moving to next because yeah. it saves as a svg file which is i guess well yeah good. that's one of the options as you can export an svg so paula has sort of um led the development on that end of um of, of working with uh eric and aaron specifically mm -hmm. to to okay, what does the file need to successfully laser cut it? Brian isn't particularly interested in, in, um, in 3D printed objects. Just that he, he thinks that, you know, they, they have a certain cheapness to them. <laughs> He's and, a, and a, a purist of the pixel, a purist of the pixel. He, he appreciates the laser cut um, work you know, and what, what you can do with laser cut acrylic or, or even, you know, trying not to singe the wood too much, but, but, but he, he appreciates that aesthetic a bit more than like the obvious layers and the, the finish of, of the 3D printed object. Um, but so yeah, um, that, that's another advantage of the, the web-based one is um, it has the built-in tool to allow you to, uh, produce the workflow to fabricate. So I'm just experimented the first two sessions. We've only had two in the lab on turtle art, but prior to moving to turtle art, kids actually played with Sphero um, bolts. And mm -hmm. so they block coded and, you know, they have a, the physicality of the robot moving around the nice embodiment of them getting down on the floor and tracing out the roots and stuff, which to me was ideal for starting 
learning geometrical shapes and angle measurement and parallel lines and all the concepts that are in our geometry curriculum. Mm -hmm. What are your, I, I, just before we went onto the recording, you were talking about different ways you move it off the screen into the physical. My students mm -hmm. had studied the videos that you can find on YouTube of Seymour Papert and the original logos were actually plotters and they were robots mm -hmm. that, that moved around. Um, what, what is your process or suggestions for moving it into the physical? You mentioned laser cutting, you mentioned 3D printing, and I mm -hmm. think you mentioned some robotics there as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, let's like, let's like start at, at sort of the most basic part is that like the whole reason why there's the, the turtle is to relate it to the, the student's physical form and the, the student's physical body and, and place and space. And so um, Dan and, and Molly, uh, Lynn Watt in teaching with Logo really emphasized the need to put yourself in the turtle's shoes. And, and in the past 12 years of teaching Logo and, and turtle art, you know, I, I tell students like, you should really purposefully get up and move about the room. I'm not asking them to just run around, but like, you know, put yourself in the turtle's shoes if you're trying to figure out how you're going to plot your way through this design and then, you know, have a friend like note the, the movements you're making. So um, trying to sort of bridge that gap between the screen and the, the, the real world in which the student inhabits, you know, has always been a, 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 a big part of logo, you know, and, and the part that, that I think oftentimes gets missed, you know, that, that like invite the students to, to put themselves in the turtle shoes and, and physically move around. Um, yeah. So in terms of like, um, you know, making the transition from, from screen to, to, to a physical, you know, a bits to atoms workflow and whatnot, I think like the biggest the, my first breakthrough with that was definitely like figuring out weight. Like you, I could take like the, the digital file that, that um, turtle art is creating. Could you hold on a sec? Sorry. Hey, well, um, you have to stop yelling in the background, but thanks. I'm muting over here. Cause there's a microwave buzzing in the background as well. <laughs> FIFA soccer is getting very exciting, but I'm, I'm afraid this secondary recording might have some weird shouting. In the background. It's okay. I'm, I'm open to editing. Yeah. So um, in terms of fabrication, like what really kind of excited me about it, it was with, with the, the tile project was you're helping kids to create a project a tool rather that allows them to create work that they'd otherwise be incapable of creating. So in this case, they would not have the capability to freestyle the, the symmetry and repetition, you know, as beautifully as they can, if they create this tool that is 3d printed or, or laser cut and, and used to stamp the, the clay. Um, and then um, sort of the, the, the far end of the, far end of the spectrum from the screen to, to the physicality is is using a floor turtle and so back when i the, the the first year that i made the decision with third graders like let's do like a really deep dive with logo and, and turtle art um we i managed to get um uh terrapin logos pro bots which are little sports car based um uh, sports car looking uh, robots that that run logo and on a keypad you can you know press a forward and then a, how many forwards and whatnot and so we we incorporated that in into the learning and in a couple of different ways we did um you know we had roll big rolls of paper so i drew a number of different courses and they had to plot their way through a course and and it was kind of the first time in their lives using a, a, a yardstick and a protractor to, to practical use, you know, like suddenly it made sense, like needing to know why you, how many degrees you're turning, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and the ones who really excelled at it, like the challenge was to actually fit the car into a, a marked parking spot at the end. And we also, you know, created art with it. Um, 
later on in, in, two th in the end of 2014, I decided I really wanted a floor turtle in 2015. And I had built uh, a floor turtle um, at my first Constructing modern, modern Knowledge using Lego uh, RCX uh, bricks, the, the big yellow brick. Um, that you could load, uh, you could load Micro Worlds logo onto it, um, but that that was a little awkward. Like that that product was aging out, and um, the uh, you know the beyond the version of Mac OS that was aging out, you couldn't talk to the brick anymore, and so that was when we found the the Arduino um, project that ran a really bastardized version of logo within the Arduino IDE. And, and the Arduino IDE still like, you know, it is what it is and, and it's, it's great in many regards, but again, like it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't make as much sense to me as, as does Logo. And, mm -hmm. and as, as such, it, like it's more difficult for me to try to teach. So, um, so yeah, you know, we found this, this version of, of, of Floor Robot and then I approached Brian about it and said, what would it take to deport actual logo to this? And he was up for the challenge and we recruited Eric um, to do that. And we had to change the microcontroller. Um, so it had a serial line uh, in it for the for logo. Um, and, and Eric and Brian did the programming and I did the documentation of it all. And, um, you know, it, and we can talk at, at, at more length about that, but that that's kind of the progression of of my uh, going from from bits to atoms, as it were. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and I I did do a, a you know I, I hinted at the beginning like with with class seven at Marymount this year, like we we did do that progression from the screen to the the floor turtle, and and, and that in turn opens up many discussions of like what's a good screen design versus what is the the floor turtle capable of, of producing and, oh. and how to temper your expectations accordingly. yeah no i like that i like that part it's in fact some of my kids you were talking about like the purpose of the tools and yeah. so as soon as some of my kids more of the artistically inclined ones knew that we we're going to be playing with shapes they already had things in their head they wanted to create so one really wanted to start with a hexagon and ended up making a kind of bracelet image with the hexagon this is like on the second class I was, yeah. I was very you know impressed when i gave them a little we called it uh rhombus bricolage time since rhombus mm -hmm. was the shape we were working on and just let them go wild with it and see what they yeah. could create out of that in a very short bit of time they had created i mean they had the basic idea of creating functions i think i'm saying that mm -hmm. correctly like creating tools within the code that they didn't include in their primary line of code yeah, they would call them procedures in Logo. So they, they're they making a procedure, sometimes a couple of procedures, and then yep. they're using those within their um, I, I, principal line of code, I'm sure. I'm and, not in, the, in the master procedure. In the master procedure. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Cynthia Solomon, who was one of the inventors of Logo, explained it. Yeah, you're building small tools that then you can combine in, a, in you know, a, a container tool. That, that accomplishes what you're you're seeking out to do. Now, I'm having them, when we work with Sphero Bolts, which is our closest ap approximation of what you're talking about, um, mm -hmm. I have them plot out line segments, like post it A, post it B, and then draw out their shape and then take a whiteboard marker. We can draw on our floors, they erase yeah. pretty easily. So they get the actual plot of the shape. Do mm -hmm. you recommend like, do you have a, does your turtle plot? Does it draw or, or is it just the, the motion and the movement? No, it plots. Like there's a, it, it has a servo on it that it can raise and lower the pen. And, oh. and so, so the way that we, the way it was interesting, like some girls did the work on the, the laptop first, they were partnered up. And, and so some would, would, you know, kind of brainstorm it on the computer and then take that code. And, and there were a few changes that had to happen. Um, you know, you you kind of exploit. You couldn't set X Y on the floor turtle. That would be you physically picking it up and and changing it. And so that was one kind of discussion that occurred. Like maybe with the floor turtle, you don't try to do this all in one shot. 
Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's run in, in segments that you're repositioning the turtle as needed. Um, and then, um, you know, other girls just jumped right onto the, the floor turtle and, and, you know, know it and, and like worked with the limitations that were there. So what are, what are the limitations? Well, the microcontroller can't do floating point math. So in non like nerd speak, there's no decimals. Mm. So once, you know, you start doing the math with it where there's a decimal, it's gonna round off. And, and so, um, you know, maybe the more repetitions you're doing, kind of the farther it's gonna drift from your original intention. So, uh, you keep, it, go ahead. So, so, you know, you, you keep your design accordingly, you know, you plan the design accordingly, that, that maybe instead of repeating, you know, 50 times, it repeats 25 times and, and you, you plan accordingly, you know. Um, it, it's like on um, turtle art, like a lot of the girls, a lot of students like immediately grab the forever block and and definitely with the older java version it, it was it was easy to to kind of lock up the the program um by telling the turtle to do something weird forever mm -hmm. um, but but you know i always ask them like well before you do it forever like maybe try doing it a hundred times <laughs> and, and then and see yeah. you know what happens and then and then scale accordingly but um yeah, yeah you know, introducing like, that forever loop to the kids was sort of a mistake at the beginning just because they just wanted to do forever loops. However, our next unit in science is energy and motion. And so we can talk about why your battery will run out eventually or. Your well, battery. see that. And that's another interesting like difference between your screen turtle and your floor turtle is friction. Uh -huh. The batteries are wearing down, you know, and you don't have that on, on the screen turtle. So. You yeah, know, it can make it can make for some interesting um, discussions and observations and serendipitous discoveries that that might occur. Yeah, um, I really liked well a couple of things that you just said there. One is I really liked working with the physical first before we moved to the screen, and the kids mm -hmm. immediately caught like, wow! In one hour of screen time, I did two weeks of robot time. Yeah, they they were just able to prototype their code a lot faster. They don't have to do the runnings and stuff. And then to the exactness of it. The, the spheral balls always have a, you know, the friction on the floor, you never yeah. get like a, an exact plot. So that's another factor there mm -hmm. as well. Um, the other part was that serendipitous learning and how to validate that. And so I approach that just through their reflections that when we, we kind of make a list of concepts that were active during the lab and we, mm -hmm. we, we preset some of those, like in this lab where, you know, we're obviously going to come across this, this, and this, and we have a math talk and we make a list of our concepts and then post, if they discovered new things, we revisit, they post it, and then they write a lab review where they're supposed to sketch out and use as many of these terms in their lab as possible so that when things do come up, which they always do, we can bring them into the discussion as well, whether it's our curricular trajectory or, or not. And so I mm -hmm. think that's a super important part to communicate to those that don't know about this kind of learning or those that are so used to um, designing learning that's already prescribed, the students yeah. will have this experience. Um, yeah. You have uh, worked in some interesting transdisciplinary spaces or interdisciplinary spaces. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure, are you a math teacher? What is your position? I'm, I'm, I'm right now I'm a creative technology teacher. Which is yeah. great. So you ride yeah. between different disciplines. So you have to work with teachers, I'm sure, in getting them to flex and pull. Do you lead with one discipline? Like, are you basically working off of kind of one curricular objective and then the others are subsidiary to that? Or how do you manage that? So, so I'm probably a bit more loose than, than you know, than a, a typical teacher might approach this just because I'm on something like my 23rd year of like working in various positions with technology with kids. And, and so I guess what, what my idea was this year with the, the three different grade levels that I teach was, um, you know, exploring kind of big topics and then how, how can you, um, how can you best 
you know, what kind of projects best support those explorations. So, so I guess the, the, I don't know, the way that I'm kind of approaching it is like from both a craft standpoint, because I'm really trying to emphasize that you don't, you don't need a PhD to do what I do, <laughs> you know, as it were, like kids can do, like my students can do what I do, you know, mm -hmm. um, because the, the floor is low enough. And that's not to say that like, it, it's not like difficult at times and, and like, you know, it's not to say that like, I throw them into the deep end of the pool. Like there's lots of scaffolding and support, but, um, and I think the other, the other really big point that, you know, like my, my um, master's action research project back in two, 2015 illuminated me to was, was the whole concept of aesthetic choice. That, that projects where you allow for aesthetic choice by the, the student are the ones that are gonna land and, and make the most connection with the student, particularly girls as the research showed, you know, that, that I was doing back in 2015, trying to get girls involved in a tech club that had become, you know, purely like a boy nerd zone. Um, and so, so, you know, projects like like the the edgelet acrylic art logo design you know we're working towards a common end and and we have like you know a common tool set and 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 materials that we're working with but you know the choice of the lights that they the color of the leds and the, the design that they they chose and then also too, like, you know, swinging back to sort of the serendipitous discoveries and how do you capture those and capitalize them on them? You know, that was like a, a big part of um, the art logo work with class eight for the, the edge lit acrylic was, you know, it, I try and speak for as short of a time as possible, but, but introduce a, a, a new tool, you know, it, to those lessons. Um, and then give them the time and space to, to play with the tool and see what they can make of it and show their friends what they can make of it. But in each of those classes, you know, as, as they made those discoveries, that got incorporated into the text file for that particular class. So by the end, we had, you know, three different text files with everything from the grass to the trees and all of the, the weird fun discoveries that, that each class had made or you know, particular students in each class had made were captured. And, and, you know, and, 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 there, and there was an opportunity to be like, hey, well, look what 8A, you know, or look what this student in, in this class, you know, share it with a different section and, and sort of inspire them and to either remix it or, or you know, push themselves to come up with something entirely different that, that knowing that like, oh, Mr. Berker's gonna show that off to the other classes, I like to show off. So here's an opportunity, you know, to, to, to share my work. Um, so, and, and, you know, the, the same goes for like the photos that I take to document the students work that end up back on the instructional website, you know, that I build out for each project. So you know, they see, hey, wait, that's my design, you know, like scrolling past it for our next lesson, like you've added that already. And, you know, next year, students will see, oh, wait, that that's the girl who's ahead of me now. Like, you know, so so showing that their work is their work is integral in the lesson, you know, that that it's not the lesson isn't something set in stone, but it their their ideas and designs and concepts that we're exploring together and their discoveries are as much part of the lesson as the knowledge that I'm attempting to impart as it were. And seeing that there's a lot of trust and faith from whoever hired you that you're just going to produce cool stuff and that your documentation through your products is validating all of this. I, I'm, I'm just kind of assuming that's a part of it. Do you have any suggestions? Might, yeah, I mean, it must be. Like I had a really good demo lesson. I actually used turtle art, you know, to, to demo um, and did, did like an exploration. We built a polygon machine and, you know, what can you build with polygons and whatnot? So yeah, I think like, you know, 
my success over the, the past, I'd say since 2010 is when I really got it together and, and like switched my mindset towards this whole maker education um, project-based learning. Um, you know, like, yeah, I think I built like a reputation that, that like I can sort of put out there and, and, and people respond to it and realize, yeah, this guy does know, you know, what he's talking about and we can, we can give him pretty free reign to do it, you know, and I'm lucky in that regard. Yeah, no, I'm more thinking like I'm not an administrator, but if, if I was thinking through that and please excuse the weed eater that's right outside no, my no, window no. at this point. No, I had a, I had a, a, a leaf blower going next door. Um, it's, one is like it. looking at sort of teachers' portfolios of what projects they've done, you know, with their kids that kind of like speaks to what kind of product you can expect from that particular instructor. And yeah. I, I guess my other question was more about the making learning visible part do you have any methods or strategies for capturing student reflections or capturing process of what they're making to explain the complexity of a lot of cognition and problem solving that's going you know on? i wish i did and like that, that is one of my shortcomings i would say is that like we're like the class time goes and we're so caught up in it that often that, that that more often than not, there isn't that time built in to, to like, you know, there's, there's sharing that's happening as the class goes, but it would be nice to sort of have that reflection. I have, I, I have tried this school year to build in at the end of a project, you know, just using a Google form to capture, like, what was the easiest part of this project? You know, what, what are you most proud of? What was the most difficult part? Just to capture that at least for myself, you know, to, to reflect on like, well, you know, next, if, if I ran, ran this again, how would I change it? Um, but but um, a lot of the work too, though, I, I have um, had the, the students as they finish it, document it, you know, use their own laptops to take a short video of, of the thing in, in use um, and, and explain its use. So, um, you know, there, there are those opportunities for, for them to, to share in that regard. And then a lot of the tools like, you know, with class seven right now, we're building, um, making musical instruments that, that ultimately like the entire table group will be creating songs together, like original songs together. So the whole process is like sharing, you know, the whole project is, is resulting in, in sharing among your small group and then the larger group. Um, so, um, you know, it, even if it isn't like necessarily getting formally captured, there, there's a lot of like observation that's happening, like from the table to the larger classroom, you know, to spilling out into the, the, the school itself. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the things that I, you know, if you're working in an environment that already kind of respects that and knows it's happening, then maybe it's, there's not the need to make it so explicit. But what I've been trying to do is show, one, how we capture students' kind of thoughts and feelings as they move through a project, and two, how they transfer that between learning spaces. So yeah. they're working in STEM lab for a week and they're doing writer's workshop. A lot of the skill sets are very similar. How do we work in a team? How do we build trust? How do we communicate and define what our problems are before we go into the build? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it could be drawing it out or it could be doing an editing and revising sketch before you go onto the document. So their plans are very concrete. Yeah. And that's what kids have kind of come up with. You know, they sort of did Google's Aristotle project from a few years ago where they tried to identify like what makes teams work. And they, in two weeks, came up with more or less a fourth grade version of the same conclusion which i thought was kind of cool let's yeah. uh talk about sacred geometries you're talking about making medieval tiles so that would have sure. been a time period where object and shape had very particular meanings across different cultures if you look at islamic culture or even some of the earlier christian designs um the sacred geometries are very uh present how do you connect or do you have any thoughts or strategies or anything uh, add to this I'm, not even, I'm not even going to presume to know anything. <laughs> no yeah. I, I was more thinking but, more like how do you connect like meaning into the design into their designs like so 
if they're making geometrical shapes, is it just a cool retinal feeling experience or do you ever like try to take it further? Well, so with the, with the class eight project this year and, and the, the edge lit acrylic, like that was, that project was done under the umbrella of what I called a cybernetic garden, you know, that, that came from a Richard Brodigan poem. And so my heavy handed thought was, we'll explore various organic forms through turtle, through art logo programming. And, and, you know, some of those forms like end up being very geometric, you know, like we can make a very geometric looking flower. Um, but in the end, like the choice became the students, like what they did, you know, they had a, a and, and, you know, they could have taken the tool set, they could have taken the tool and gone any way with, with it that they wanted. And I'd say out of the, I'm going to say 60 students, just, you know, there's, there's 60 students in class eight, you know, the actual number is 57 or 56 or something, but out of the, the total class, I would say one student kind of was like, okay, I have this tool now i'm going to do something completely different and she did like a spiral like a very complex spiral that that you know spills over on itself and whatnot and the rest just took what we had built you know and we had some cool looking trees and some cool looking flowers with stems and and leaves and um you know some purely geometric forms so um you know like it, it it's that was an interesting experiment and like how heavy handed can you be you know how, how much how directed do you try to make this project so like the tile project you know like again like there's some parameters in it you know like your tile will be fabricated five inches square so and you're going to use that to stamp an object that you'll be painting and so if if it is too complex like you won't be able to paint it like you'll be there in, in July, you know? And so you have, so that sort of begins to inform some of the aesthetic choices. And, and you know, your pen really needs to be probably at least eight versus the, the default four. You need a kind of a wider pen so you aren't running, you know, you aren't, um, because with this particular project, we're laser cutting it. So, so you aren't burning up the material, you know, if, you're, if your lines are too thin, there won't be any material left. So um, again, that, that informs the aesthetic choice. So there, there are some like kind of, you, you know, you could almost say like heavy handed limitations that, that some of these projects put on, you know, put, require, you know. Um, but then I've also done projects where, you know, like where it's, it's screen based or like where you're making a, an iron on transfer for a shirt where you can, you know, more or less capture what's on the screen. Um, and, you know, there's going to be a little difference in the, the colors between the screen and what your printer is able to produce. But, um, you know, the, 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 the limitations are, are a little less uh harsh um doing that kind of work but you know like that that's that's part of the 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 hard fun struggle of it you know like even if you're looking at like a a project like turtle stitch where you're programming to to embroider um you know like there there's choices you have to make in that because of the limitation of the materials and sewing over the same point in the fabric will will eventually tear the fabric so your design has to, to work accordingly. Um, and I think that, you know, that that's part of the, the hard fun of it. Um, well, let's talk about microcontrollers since you've designed one. Um, what are- Well, I designed a project around one, yeah. I mean, you, you were on the team to design one at Conceptual Work is designing, I guess, as well. Um, so people that are interested, and I know you've written a couple of books on makerspaces uh, with Sylvia mm -hmm. Martinez, and you've been to Constructing Modern Knowledge, I don't know how many times. So you're very much in 
the know of where to move to microcontrollers. If you're yeah. moving from turtle art to microcontroller, what are your what what should people consider? Because I know there's a lot of very higher end commercial things like Sphero Bolt, um, but maybe people don't have to spend one hundred and seventy seven dollars on one robot. Yeah. So I guess like the. I guess the biggest consideration is is understanding what a microcontroller is and what it can and can't do. You know, like I know what at constructing modern knowledge for a number of, of summers, it was, you know, Arduino was kind of this this the hot word that, you know, people were sent to to CMK to figure out what this Arduino was and how they could bring it back to their schools and make it make it do some kind of magic. And and again, you know, the Arduino IDE, it, it it's based on on C, and it's you know, there's a lot of weird brackets and stuff, and it's not really human readable, and so a lot of they're the not going to be they're not going to be learning C anytime soon. <laughs> well, I mean, what it ended up being is like a lot of projects, like you end up trying to find a project that's pretty similar to what you're achieving, and then you copy and paste the code without really understanding what happens and. And, and then you hope it compiles. And if it doesn't compile, then it becomes a, a search for the arcane ar error message that the IDE is thrown at you. And, you know, so it, so more than anything, it becomes frustrating. So I guess like, you know, before, before you decide you need to get a microcontroller involved, like understand what a microcontroller is. And, and all it is is basically is like, a really smart switch that you're using it to to either respond to events through a sensor you've connected to it or to to react to events through outputs like motors that that you've connected to it um and so you know real understanding that like then you know the projects can kind of begin to to naturally um evolve you know like so one project that i want to do here to kind of wrap up the the end of the school year is a, a robot petting zoo and and i think i'm going to use the um the uh, hummingbird um brain bird uh what is it bird brain technology the hummingbird um that you know is is a microcontroller that has has uh uh a nice um, scratch like programming interface and snap that shouldn't be too overwhelming. Um, but, but, you know, recently I saw somebody on Twitter had done a, a robot petting zoo and they, they just described it so succinctly that, you know, it needed to have a sensor and it needed to have a movement, you know? And, and so I think if, if you, if you think about it that way as okay, you know, like, well, my, my sense could be, you know, a light sensor. And as somebody's shadow falls over it, then it causes the, the movement to happen. Um, and so kind of recognizing like, you need not have something super complex to begin with, but like, you know, an Arduino project like that, that's accomplishable. And, and, and it offers like a chance for whimsy. I mean, the, really, I think the only, you know, beyond, beyond like using microcontrollers in conjunction with logo, you know, whether that's the, the logo floor turtle, or I do a lot of work with light logo, which is, you know, running a version of logo on an Arduino that's connected to, to NeoPixels that you can program still or animating designs and that and, and start storytelling through through light, um, you know, the, the, the way that I use microcontrollers mostly in my project is to, to do really lo-fi audio playback, you know, purposefully lo-fi audio playback on like, on like a, a, a series that I have on, called, that I've called AirSats Nature, where, you know, it's kind of a dystopian take on nature. Um, and, uh, you know, the most accomplished microcontroller project I think is robot Josh that is is on my blog that you know is a 3d printed head and hands of, of mine that that are on a hacked toy that 
you know, are controlled by two different microcontrollers, one that's that's playing the music that I dance to and the other that's controlling the motors from, from the toy that make me dance. And, you know, the idea of that is that that I can now have somebody busk for me, but nobody care, carries change anymore. So maybe the next thing is to hook it up to like a, a square, um, you know, stripe reader. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, like microcontrollers can be great fun, but they can also be like great points of frustration. So, so I guess like before you decide you need to, to do the microcontroller, like what is it, you know, that you're looking to do with it, you know? And like, like I mentioned light logo, like that's a really good use for a microcontroller. You're turning on and off lights, but you're doing it like, you know, you're doing it with logo. So you're, you're venturing into that realm of learning to think about thinking and how do you do it concisely, you know, in a text space language. Um, you know, I, I did a big project once upon a time building a, a Galileo ramp for, for one of um, my collaborating science teachers where we used um, Snap for Arduino. Again, because like the, the learning curve was lower than, than trying to figure out how to do it all in the, in the Arduino IDE. And, and that was, you know, like we got it to be pretty, pretty reliable, but it was a lot of like, crossing your fingers and incantations, you know, to, to get it going. So, you know, I think like something polished, like, like the Sphero or, you know, some of these polished robots are, are a great idea because they, they lower the floor to entry. Um, well, it certainly but, gave us access to a lot of physicality right out of the box. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When I looked at the price of what it was, I was like, <laughs> should we be touching these things um right. but it yeah i mean the animation thing the two lights you have a front light a back light and mm -hmm. so what we're moving into this week is documentation of some of the flowers they've created out of geometrical nice. shapes and mm -hmm. then we'll take a open a camera shutter and try to capture the full design yeah and nice. so that'll lead very nicely into our unit on energy um mm -hmm. basically just in how energy works um, yeah. So all of these things can come into play there. The the circuitry you're talking about, the microcontrollers, I, I would definitely want to get them in some kind of hands-on thing. We have mm -hmm. some already developed. It's like a kind of out of the kit STEM program or STEM like materials of a, a windmill and they design the blades so they can like 3D, 3D cut those. And we have a mm -hmm. lot to work with as far as how to incorporate all these different elements. And look, our at, um, are, look at Mike Carroll's scrappy circuits. Um, which is a, a book that, that Sylvia just helped put out, but the website has all the materials as mm. the book. That was one of his conditions was, I want to keep this curriculum free. You know, there, there, there's a bit more in the book, but like the basis is all on the website. And that, you know, that's what I did with class eight this year was like, okay, what's a circuit? Well, let's, you know, and, and Mike's idea was you can take a, a $1 little tea light fake candle and, and dissect the parts from that and mm. and basically build your beginning of, of what turns into you know what what little bits is as a product you know like a modular circuit construction kit that that you're building with binder clips and and alligator clips and and salvage parts so you know definitely definitely look at that because i think that's really empowering for the kids that like you know, it, there, there's no black box involved in that. Like you can see the circuitry, you, you're, you're building the circuitry. And when it doesn't work, it's because, you know, you've reversed the polarity of the LED or something. And you mm -hmm. know, that's, that's the lasting lesson right there um, that, that um, you know, that some of the, the, the more polished products may not reveal. Oh, no, that's perfect. I mean, yeah, I would love to pick your brain more, more for these things, but maybe you could point us in the right direction. You have two books on making with um, Sylvia Martinez. Mm -hmm. you, you've mentioned uh, Scrappy Circuits. Mm -hmm. One, how do people catch up with what you've done and what you're doing now? Yeah. I, know, I know you have a Twitter feed, not so active, but your Instagram feed is very active. Well, um, no, my, I'd say my Twitter feed's more active. So my Instagram feed's pretty, pretty like, closed so don't point people there um but but i'd say if so so once upon a time my blog was was a very good way to sort of keep up with, with what i was doing um 
but then I figured out I could write books and make money from sharing how I do it. Um, and so, you know, I, I did the two books under the, the um, Constructing Modern Knowledge imprint and with Sylvia as my editor. Um, and those are great, but like um, technology moves, you know? And so even, you know, there, the projects in, in book one, the projects in book two are still like, they're still alive like they still work but like you know some of them like you know the hardware's aged out like you'd have a hard mm -hmm. time getting a pico board from book one running the way you know i describe it in book one though i'm still really bummed that nobody has done you know more interactive dungeons like like in book one so so you know i i think the books are still um totally vital and and i i think people still get a, a big kick out of the books and like learn a lot of really good skills. Um, I'd say that the, the blog, like I, I don't keep up with it as much as I, as I used to. Part of it is that like the projects that I work on for my personal enjoyment have become so strange that it's really like, <laughs> you know, for my personal satisfaction, you know, like, like I think one of the late last posts and and there's like you know there's some posts in my head that i need to to commit the time to get to get on on there but like you know one of the the, the latest posts on it was like a sonic sabotage device around the the at tiny 85 and and playing around with this idea of william burroughs and like you know broadcasting snippets of sounds and in, in public to subliminally influence people so <laughs> i so you know like the at tiny 85 is a really cool piece of hardware like super cheap like it's you know basically an arduino on a chip that you know you they're, they're so cheap you can kind of ditch them places and 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 have it but so yeah you, you know that's a, a weird project and like you know i could document the heck out of it and have other people build them but to what end like maybe one other person's going to build it so i'd say the best place to sort of keep track of what what it is i'm up to would be twitter um and and it's there that i'm sharing a lot of like my student successes and and explorations and what they're doing i share a lot of like the art that i work on um in the art logo and and turtle art um and then, you know, like every now and again, like a, a, a good reflection, like, um, you know, this actually times out really well. Like I, there's a, a good thread. It was actually, I think, kind of the first thread I've done. And I've been on Twitter since 2007. Um, and so the first thread, I, I, long thread I've done um, talking about an experience that happened yesterday where uh, a student I taught in 2015 and 16, in my, my kind of gap year between jobs, I started an after school logo programming club at a charter school in Bridgeport um, at a, a middle school. And out of all the kids who I worked with that, that school year, one kid like persisted through the school year um, and ended up uh, building one of the, the first logo turtles with me and then ended up deciding to ask me if would it be cool if he entered the logo turtle in the talent show <laughs> at the end of the school year and i was like heck yeah <laughs> i got a and we got a document camera and a, a projector and put a sheet up in the gym and we had kids on their feet cheering this robot at the talent <laughs> show and 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 so i had last seen him in 2017 he had changed schools he had started at a stem school and I had changed laptops, so I helped him get the logo turtle software going on that laptop. And then, you know, a few weeks ago, I was wondering, like, where where did Isaiah go? Like, I wonder what that kid's up to. Like, you know, he's got to be out of high school by now. And then two days ago, he texts me out of the blue, "Hey, Mr. Josh, is this still your phone number?" <laughs> yeah, I didn't, well, you know what's going on? He's like, I was showing the the logo turtle to one of my mom's students, and I want to get it going again. So <laughs> yesterday, he came over. And, um, you know, we ended up moving his breadboarded logo turtle to, to one of the PCBs that I had had manufactured and, and uh, you know, like had a good talk as, as, as I worked on it for him and whatnot, got it running on his laptop. And 
he was going to share it with the fifth grader that his mom tutors and, and, you know, is interested in robots. So, and, and meanwhile, Isaiah is like gearing up and studying to take a test to start the road to becoming an electrician. So, you know, as I say in the Twitter thread, my wife's a much better teacher than I am, but, and, and she talks about like the ripples that, that a good teacher can create. And, you know, I have this kid looking me up six years down the road, you know, still wanting to use the, the, this logo turtle that we built together. He told me that his grandfather still watches the video that I took of him at, at the talent show showing off, you know, his programming chop. So, it, you know, these ripples, like it, it, it's really cool. Like, you know, these kind of like, you hope they take it seriously, but at the time, like, you know, maybe inconsequential lesson, like really affects some of the kids and like has these lasting effects. So, you know, that, 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 it, it's, it, those rewards are few and far between, but when they pop up, it, it's cool to have happen. In this moment where a lot of schools are moving or have been back full time for a while, but many have only been back full time since January. So for example, where I'm working, they've only gone back full time since January. And I believe this, all of this maker culture plays a critical role in that social emotional part of getting kids back together, communicating together. And this is why I was talking about focusing on those bridges between writer's lab and STEM lab or makerspace is, you know, what made that group work so well? Well, they were yeah. able to build trust really quickly. They're able to communicate their ideas and then they had the agency to go after it. And so I think you're sort of packaging up a lot of those things, but I think this is part of our school renewal as we're all, you know, demasking and getting back face to face. These are, these, I think, are critical parts of that coming back together, yeah. Yeah, and I think maker education too really um, builds on the idea that there's multiple experts in the room. You know, it's not necessarily the teacher who knows all, that, that your peers are gonna be figuring out things on the journey and, and their resources as well. And, and you know, creating a, a, a community that, that shares and the successes with one another and, and, and builds on one another's um, knowledge and success, you know, that, that's really powerful, cross-disciplinary. We're back open. Let's, you know, let's let the games begin again. And I love all of this open source stuff that you offer and a lot of the other people that center around constructing modern knowledge. I think that's super important for keeping it going. Uh, mm -hmm. We can't get your books here because they're only in offered physically. But when yeah. I'm in the States, I'll try to pick up copies and bring them back and we can kind of scour. I love hunting just for cool projects and that other people have done to see how you can adopt that for your space as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, definitely check me out on Twitter. It's just Josh Berker. And like, you'll see, you know, like retweets and, and you know, encouragement there. Cool. Josh, thank you for taking a good chunk of your morning. Uh, hope you enjoy the it rest of the pleasure. day. It was my pleasure. Yeah, it was yeah. always I'm fun a, to talk shop. I'm going to disconnect here. And if you just stay um, online just for a few more minutes.